In our journey through the Bible, we've come this week to the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. And we will be studying the 15th chapter tonight in its entirety. So we encourage you as a background to read it over before you join with us at 7 o'clock to worship the Lord and to study His Word. This morning we'd like to look at the first part of the 15th chapter because it deals with the subject of salvation. What one must do to be saved and just what it means to be saved. If you say, I have been saved, the natural question would be, saved from what? And according to the scriptures, we have been saved from our bondage to sin. You see, sin has a way of wrapping its tentacles around your life until you are held in its grip, held in its power. I can remember when I was in sixth grade, our school went on a field trip up to the Rincon Beach at a very low tide. And we waited among the tide pools looking at the sea urchins and the various forms of sea life. And in one of these little pools, I saw a squid. And so I grabbed it. And it then grabbed me. (laughs) It began to wrap its little suction cup tentacles around me. And it was interesting. I called my friends and they came over and they were trying to pull the uh, arms of the squid off of me and then it would attach to them. And uh, we had a great time playing with that squid because... Uh, it would seem just as soon as you pulled one tentacle off, it would wrap you with another one. And it, you know, we thought we were going to hold it, but we ended up being held by it. And sin is much that way. Just as we think that we're getting freed from one tentacle, there's another tentacle that latches on to us. And it begins to hold us in its power. We become victims. We become bound by sin. The Bible refers to it as the bondage of corruption. And when I say I have been saved, I have been saved from this bondage of corruption. From sin which was destroying my life. From the power of sin that was holding me as a captive, causing me to do things that I didn't even want to do but could not stop doing because of the strong hold that it had on my life. But I'm also saved from the consequences of my sin. Sin is destructive. It has a destructive effect upon you. And in the end, it will destroy you. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. And when I am saved, I am saved from the consequences of my sin. I no longer must die because of my sin. I've been saved from the judgment and the wrath of God which will be poured out against sin. Paul in Romans 1 said, For the wrath of God shall be poured out upon the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who hold the truth of God in unrighteousness. But I don't have to fear that wrath of God because I have been saved from the wrath to come through my faith in Jesus Christ. 
When you talk about being saved, it naturally assumes the condition of being lost. One has to be lost in order to be saved. If you are not saved, then you are lost. Jesus said that he came to seek and to save those who were lost. What does it mean to be lost? It means that you are a loss to God. You are not fulfilling the purpose for which God created you. And thus, God looks at you as a debit. He created you with the specific purpose that you know Him, that you love Him, that you come into a loving relationship with Him. And if you are not living in that relationship with God, then your whole purpose of existence has been thwarted. You are a loss to God. But being lost to God, you are also then a loss to yourself. All of those things that you are doing, all of the accomplishments are of really no eternal value. You may be getting some temporary excitement, but no eternal value is coming forth from your life. It means that you are without hope because you are without God in this world. It means that you really don't know what living is. Paul the Apostle said, for me to live is Christ. But if you don't know Christ, then you don't know what living is. The Bible tells us that he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. But he that doesn't believe in the Son doesn't know life. You really don't know what living is. And the wrath of God abides on him. Paul said, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. And when you're saved, Christ becomes your life. And you really know then what God intended life to be. Paul spoke about those who were dead while they were still living. He said, if you are spending your life just living for pleasure, if that's your chief goal in God, then you are dead while you're still alive. To be lost means to spend eternity apart from God. But what am I saved for? You see, this is sort of the negative aspect of salvation to say that I've been saved from the bondage of sin, I've been saved from the wrath of God and consequences of sin. But what, I've, what have I been saved for? There's the positive side to salvation. And I've been saved in order that I might enjoy living in fellowship with God, the creator of the universe that I might have a meaningful, loving relationship with God. That I can know God, live in fellowship with Him. And this fellowship with God brings such contentment. It brings such peace and satisfaction because now I am fulfilling the very basic purpose of my existence. Fellowship with God brings an indescribable joy. But this fellowship with God is not possible as long as you are still in the bondage of sin, as long as you are lost, as long as you have not yet been saved, it's impossible to know this fellowship with God. John said, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet we are walking in darkness, we are lying and we don't know the truth. But I've been saved in order that I might enjoy the eternal glories of God's kingdom and live with him, world without end, in his heavenly kingdom. 
The Bible said in his presence there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And to be saved means that I'm going to enjoy that fullness of joy and those pleasures forever. Jude tells us that Jesus one day is going to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jesus promised to his disciples everlasting life. And John says, this is the record. God has given to us eternal life. This life is in his son, and he who has the son has life. So I've been saved in order that I might have eternal life in the kingdom of God. Now, as we look at the book of Acts chapter 15, there was a problem that developed over the subject of salvation. And the issue was, what does it take to be saved? In Antioch, the church was comprised mainly of Gentile believers. The church in Jerusalem probably didn't have any Gentile believers, but they were all Jews. But as the gospel went out and was received in the Gentile world, there were more and more Gentiles receiving Christ, and the church of Antioch was Uh, composed largely of Gentile believers. But there came some of the brothers from the church in Jerusalem. And they saw this Gentile church. They saw the liberty that they had. They were probably eating pork chops and uh, other delectables. Uh, They were eating cheeseburgers, uh, drinking milk with their meat. And, And they said, wait a minute, what are you doing? You guys haven't been circumcised and you're not keeping the law of Moses. You can't possibly be saved. And, and it began to create a, a, a problem with these new believers. They were thinking, you mean I'm not saved? And they were saying, no, you, you haven't been circumcised. You can't be saved unless you're circumcised according to Moses. Now, you see, the Jews believed that salvation was for the Jews only. They believed that Gentiles could not be saved. If you were a Gentile, your only hope of salvation was to become a Jew, which meant you had to go through the rite of circumcision And then you had to subscribe to the Mosaic Law and be baptized. And then you would be a Jew. And as a Jew, you could be saved. And so they were passing on this works trip. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law of Moses if you're going to be saved. So Paul stood up to them and they got in this big argument. There was a great dissension over the issue. And Paul said, there's only one thing to do. Let's go back to Jerusalem. Let's get this issue settled by the leaders of the church. Let's settle once and for all what part the Gentile believer has with the law of Moses or with works as far as his salvation is concerned. So they came back to the church in Jerusalem and the first church council was established to determine what the Gentile believer had to do with the law of Moses, the ordinances of the laws of Moses. Now, the issue is basically what does one have to do to be saved? Are we saved through faith and works? And if works, what 
works. Who prescribes what work I must do in order to be saved? Some were saying the work of circumcision and keeping the law of Moses. There are many today who still teach that salvation is through faith and works. Most of the cult groups require certain works for salvation, but not just cult groups. Many of the churches teach that there are certain works necessary in order to be saved. Am I saved by faith alone or is it a combination of my faith and my works? Several years ago, a young man came up to me, two class years ago, and he said, Chuck, I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm a Mormon now. And I knew that he didn't really understand the Mormon faith because the Mormons do say that they are Christians. But he was just a young man, a novice, and so what he was seeking to say is, I have changed religions, and I am now following the practice of the Mormons. I said to him, tell me this, on what do you base your hope for salvation and eternal life? Now surely you're hoping to be saved. You're hoping to have eternal life. What are you basing that hope upon? He responded, my faith in Jesus Christ and continued membership in the Mormon church. Now, this is true for many people. They are adding to faith in Jesus Christ something further. Their works of penitence, their confessions, uh, their prayers, or it's something beyond just faith in Jesus Christ. The question is, can faith in Jesus Christ alone bring you salvation, or is it necessary to add to that faith certain works? And the Bible seems to teach that salvation is through faith alone. You say, but faith without works is dead. True. But the works don't save you. The works only demonstrate the genuineness of your faith. In other words, if you truly believe in Jesus Christ, there will be changes in your life. You will no longer be practicing sin. You will no longer go around in bitterness, a chip on your shoulder, hating everybody and everything. You'll have a changed attitude, a changed heart, a changed life. It will be manifested in in a life that is changed. In good works. But those good works don't save you. And you cannot trust in those works to save you. The only one that can save you is Jesus Christ. One day they came to Jesus and they asked what must we do to do the works of God? A fair and legitimate question. One that we should all be interested in. What do I have to do to do the work of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God. Believe on him whom he has sent. The work is to believe. Just to believe on Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. Remember, well, don't remember. It's in the next chapter. You'll get to it next week. In the 16th chapter. When the Philippian jailer came in trembling when the prison had uh, been shaken by the earthquake. All of the doors were open and the jailer uh, started to commit suicide. And Paul cried out and said, 
don't do that, we're all here. And he came. That was a good brothers. What must I do to be saved? Their answer believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now they didn't say and then keep the law, be circumcised and, and go down the whole list of works. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So as the church had gathered to make a determination on what was necessary for salvation. Various ones got up and gave their experiences of what they had seen God do among the Gentiles. And Peter stood up and he said, fellas, you know that God first chose me to take the gospel to the Gentiles that they might believe. And when they believed, God obviously saved them because he filled them with the Holy Spirit. Now, none of them were circumcised. None of them had kept the law of Moses. But God confirmed that they were saved because he gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, Peter declared, he put no difference between the Jew and the Gentile purifying their hearts by faith. They believed, they had faith in the message, and God purified their hearts by faith. Paul amplifies this in his letter to the Romans, chapter 3, beginning with verse 9. He said, what then? Are we Jews better than the Gentiles? No, in no way. For we have before proved that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. They have, there are none that understand or seek after God. They have all left the path of God and they are unprofitable. There is not one of them who is doing good. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they've used deceit. The poison of serpents is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. And now we know that what things the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world might become guilty before God. You see, all the law can do is point the guilty finger at you and say, you are guilty. Because none of us have kept the law. In fact, Peter went on to say, why should we put on them a yoke of bondage that neither we nor our fathers were able to keep? None of us had kept the law. So the law points its finger and says, you're guilty. But the law can't point its finger and say, you're saved. Now, let us assume that righteousness could come by the law. By your good works, you could earn your way to heaven. Let's, let's just assume that you can't, but let's assume that you could. That if you kept God's law perfectly, you'd be saved. And so you spent your life, as did the Pharisees, in trying to keep the law completely. Yet the law itself says, if you keep the whole law, yet you violate once. In one thing, you're guilty of everything. I mean, one mistake wipes you out. But let's assume that you're special. <laughs> and you haven't had one slip. Perfect record. You're on your way. And you're driving down the freeway 65 miles an hour. And in your rear view mirror, you see this crazy guy behind you in and out of traffic. And he's traveling at a tremendous speed, weaving in and out. And as he pulls up beside you, you think, you're not going to cut in front of me, Buster. And, and so you pull up close to the car in front of you so he doesn't have room to cut in front of you. Because his line of traffic is going to slow up and you know that he's going to try and 
slip in there. So you pull up close enough to where he can't. But the crazy nut pulls in front of you anyhow. And you're so upset, you curse him as you hit him. (laughs) And as your car rolls over, you're gone. Too bad. That was a good try. You came close. But if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. That's why you better not try to be saved by works. Because you won't make it. That is why God has made salvation through faith. It is not my work, but it's God's work that counts. So I'm not trusting in my works. Now, I'm not saying to God, look how many hours I put in every week serving you. Look how many chapters of the Bible I read. I'm not trusting in any of that to save me. I'm trusting fully in Jesus Christ. But because I love Jesus, and because he loves me, and because we have this neat loving relationship, there's not enough that I can do for him. After the whole week is over. You know what my greatest wish is? That I have more time to devote to him. You know, I I wish I could somehow clone myself so that I could have more time to just serve the Lord because there isn't enough time in the day to do everything that I want to do for him. Now, what I do for him isn't saving me at all. It's the result of the fact that I am saved, that I want to do these things. And and it's sort of a test to the genuineness of the faith that I have in Jesus, my desire to do these things that would please him. Paul went on to say to the Romans, all have sinned. There's no difference between the Jew or the Gentile. We have all of us sinned and come short of the glory of God. But all of us are being justified freely by the grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Works? No. But by the law of faith. You see, if I could be saved by works, then heaven would be one big bragging session. Be a miserable place. I would want to be telling you... All of the good things I did. What I did to get here, man. I mean, I did this and I did that. And, and, and you'd think, will you please shut up so I can tell you how good I am? <laughs> but there's no place for boasting. It's not what I've done. What I'm doing for God is what God has done for me. That's what counts. And Paul tells that to the Ephesians. He said, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Salvation is God's gift for you. Not of works, lest any man should boast. There you have it again. For we are his workmanship, Paul said. Not my works, it's his work. We are his workmanship as we have been created together in Christ Jesus unto the good works that God has before ordained that we should accomplish for him. So, The early church came to the conclusion that salvation is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. Verse 11. It's only by God's grace and through faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved. So it was determined that they should not try and put the Gentiles under the Mosaic law. Not to put on them that burden, but just to encourage them to keep their lives sexually pure and to follow Jesus. And if you do that, you're doing well. God bless you. Basically, the letter that they sent. 
throughout the rest of the New Testament, this salvation through grace by faith in Jesus Christ is amplified, is taught, and is declared. Salvation then is for everyone. God's offer is to all men, whosoever will, let him come. And you can know what it is today to be saved from the bondage of sin, power of darkness, the wrath of God. You can know what it is to have fellowship with God and have hope of eternal life in God's glorious kingdom. That's what being saved is all about. And it is so simple. As Paul said to the Philippian jailer, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that Jesus made the way. He prepared the road that leads to his abode. A road marked by blood, but it leads us safely home. Thank you, Father, for the work that Jesus did for us. And that the cross was the finished work for our salvation. That by the law and what the law could not do, Because of the weakness of our flesh, Jesus has done for us. And now, Lord, you've made available to us this glorious salvation. By our just putting our trust and our faith in Jesus, we are cleansed from all of our sin. Lord, draw us to your love and to this salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? I think the question basically is this. We all want eternal life. We all want to be saved. On what are you basing your hope for salvation today? Faith in Jesus Christ? Do you put an and there? Or can you just say my faith in Jesus Christ? Are you trying to add something to that? Are you trying to add works or or whatever? Or can you just say I have put my faith and trust in Jesus. I'm trusting him to save me because he promised he would if I would trust him. Happy is the man who has come to know the grace of God through Jesus Christ. The Bible says they have ceased from their labor and they've entered into his rest. You see, God is resting in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. I'm resting where God is resting. My salvation, I'm resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain, but he's washed me white as snow. And he'll wash you today if you will but put your trust in him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I'd encourage you, if you're not certain of your salvation, you go back to the prayer room. Pastors and counselors will be back there to minister to you. And you can have today that wonderful assurance that you are saved. I wouldn't want to drive on the freeway going home if I didn't have that assurance. (laughs) Because you never know. But oh, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He paid the price. The ransom for me.